Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Janissa Jackson, and I serve as a community group leader here at Cross Community and in the youth ministry with some fabulous seventh grade girls. Uh, my little brother happens to be the pastor here, just in case you needed a little trivia for today, how we all fit together. Um, I'm gonna read to you out of Acts chapter 20 uh, in the English Standard Version, and it's gonna be verses 17 through 30. So follow along with me. Uh, now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time, from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor is precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. This is the word of the Lord. So the downside about that is I don't get to make jokes about her being my older sister. That's not a, a fair fight there. But uh, today we're going to be looking into Acts chapter 20, which is one of the more unique chapters in the New Testament book of Acts. Now, if you've been with us through much of the series, uh, you'll know that Acts is basically a story of how God builds his church through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so on the day of Pentecost, we see the church is born. The Holy Spirit falls on the people. The church is born. Uh, it begins to expand and grow, and daily there were more and more believers being added to their number. And the gospel didn't stay in Jerusalem, uh, but as, as a persecution came in, it began to spread across really the known world at the time. Uh, people went out, Peter and James and Paul, and they began to declare the gospels. It went uh, out from not, to, to, not just to the Jews, but also it went to the Gentiles. And so it's this beautiful story of how God was building his church around the world. And yet, this this chapter of Acts is distinct in that it isn't just a story of how God is building his church and what happened. This chapter of Acts is actually uh, the farewell address of the Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus where he had spent three years of his life. It reads a little more like one of Paul's letters that we have in the New Testament. Um, but I, I want you to understand uh, more clearly what, what's going on here. The Apostle Paul, he's been in Ephesus for three years. He's been teaching them. Uh, he's spent time with them there in their city. He's been in their homes. He's taught them in public. Uh, but, and and there have been some really great things. People have come to faith in Jesus Christ, which we all celebrate, right? Households have been transformed. Lives have been changed. People had been set free. Like, there was much to celebrate. And yet, the Apostle Paul's time at Ephesus had been one of difficulty as well. Uh, there had been trials. There had been persecution there in the city from the Jews who had come in. It had been a difficult time. The Apostle Paul is going to describe times of tears and of difficulty there with the people. Now, I want you to imagine this. 
for whatever reason, life circumstances happen, and you are going to have to leave your home, your friends, your job, your family, and you are going to go live somewhere where you know it's so far away, the circumstances are such that you will never see the people that you know and love and and live life with right now. You will never see them again. I want you to imagine as the day approaches and you realize I've got one more time to meet with those people. Um, My question for you is, what would you want to say to them on that day? The last time you're ever going to see your set of friends or maybe your your neighbor that you're close to or your coworker or even your family member, um, one final time to address them. What would you want to say? That's the situation that we have here in Acts chapter 20. Uh, The Spirit in His sovereign will has called the Apostle Paul to go to Jerusalem. He's promised him um, there are going to be imprisonments. There's going to be beatings along the way. The Apostle Paul, he feels compelled by the Spirit to go, and so he's going to go. And he tells the Ephesian believers, uh, you're never going to see my face again. And so uh, these are men and women with whom he had a depth of relationship, and yet that is going to be severed, at least the face-to-face component. What would you say? if you were having to leave. Um, And we're going to look today at what the Apostle Paul did choose to speak to the Ephesian elders uh, here as he is leaving the city. Now, this is no small task. It tells us that he's at Miletus, which was about 20 to 30 miles from Ephesus. And so he calls for the elders of Ephesus to come to him. And so it would have taken about three days for them to make this journey to come and hear what the Apostle Paul has to say to them. So I want to read just a little bit here in chapter 20, beginning in verse 17, just so you get a, a sense of kind of the, the story and what, what's happening. It says, Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus, and he called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they, when they came to him, he said to him, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time. Now, the Apostle Paul was not living separately. He wasn't, you know, in an ivory tower somewhere, you know, conducting his ministry on Sundays and then, you know, disappearing throughout the rest of the week. But rather, he had lived... Uh, among them. Continuing on, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I didn't shrink back from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to the Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. And so this is how the Apostle Paul has been living among them. He taught them in public and he taught them in their homes. He taught the Jews and he taught the Greeks the gospel. He had lived with this group of people. But one of the things that he points out in his final address is found in, in verse 28 here of chapter 20. And it's, it says this, He says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Now, this word obtain in the Greek, it it really probably should better be translated purchased. Uh, The church of Jesus Christ, which he purchased with his own blood. In Paul's farewell address to the Ephesian elders that was going to be delivered ultimately to the church, he reminds them of the worth of the church of Jesus Christ. He reminds them that they were purchased with the blood of Jesus. And this is no small thing, right? This, you think about this. Um, Jesus Christ died so that you and I could really live. Like he shed his blood on the cross and he was looking forward to a day when you and I would, would be alive here on this earth, that we would no longer spend our lives enslaved to sin, but we might live out the abundant life in Christ Jesus. He was willing to die that you and I might live. Now, the gospel is this. You and I were once separated from Jesus Christ because of our sin. And Jesus went to the cross And there on the cross, he bore our sin. He shed his blood to make an atoning sacrifice for our sin. We owed a debt that we couldn't pay. And yet he purchased us with his own blood. Just a few things I want to point out to you about uh, the worth of the church, the gospel message behind our very existence. Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, he knew your name, he knew your life, He knew your good days and your bad days and your really, really bad days. He knew it all. And Jesus Christ chose to die for you. He went and suffered that you and I might truly live. 
there, there's this thing that we have in our, our culture where sometimes we're a little bit suspicious of people, right? Um, maybe someone befriends you and you sometimes you wonder a little bit like, are they being my friend because they want something from me, right? I mean, because uh, that can happen. You know, people are a little bit self-centered and I can be that way at times. And so we're a little bit suspicious of the relationships because people that pursue us, they want something from us. And so we're maybe a little bit standoffish. Here's the thing about God. We had nothing to bring to the table before God. There's no goodness we're going to do Him. There's no service we're going to offer to Him. The only thing you and I brought to the table was our sin. And yet Jesus Christ pursued us. He wanted a relationship with us, and He was willing to go to the cross in order to purchase us with His own blood, in order that we might be set free from our sin, that we might have a relationship with Him. God knows your story. He knows the worst of it. He knows the days that you're ashamed of, the things that you never want to speak about, the things that you don't want to, you know, consider in your mind. You try to push them behind so you never have to think of them. Jesus knows every last detail, and yet he chose you. There on the cross, Jesus was saying, I want him, and I want her. He purchased us with his own blood. And, and I want to say this. Jesus is not waiting on a better version of you. That's, you know, if you'll just attain this, if you'll get in church a little bit more, or you'll learn to study your Bible or become a little more holy, if you'll just get your act together, be the kind of mom you're supposed to be or dad, or if you'll get your junk together as a student, then God would love you. Listen, there is nothing you and I could ever do to make God love us any more. Can I say that again to you? There is nothing you or I could ever do that would make God love you more. He purchased us with his own blood on the cross. And as the Apostle Paul is leaving these believers in Ephesus, gathers these elders together, he wants to remind them of their worth in Christ Jesus. Whenever I was uh, in college, I, Stillwater is a small town. It's a town of about 25,000 people that when school is in session, it balloons to about 50,000 people. And so getting a job can be really difficult. And so I found myself in the esteemed position of being a sacker at Albertsons. And so uh, it, it's pretty much the lowest rung of the totem pole, if you will, or whatever the rung of the ladder that you can be on there. And I was sacking groceries. I learned a few things. Um, it does matter what goes in which sack, right? What you put together in a grocery bag. And it does matter where you set the groceries in an old lady's trunk. There is an order to it. And, and I had to learn it uh, rather quickly. Now, in my time there at Albertsons, I, I I kind of show up and I get hired for the job and my boss explains to me, she's like, hey, uh, one of the hallmarks of Albertson's grocery store is we want to be the cleanest grocery store that anyone's ever shopped in. And so every 15 minutes, uh, we would have to sweep every floor, right, in the place and then we would have to clean every single bathroom. And so I, I show up to work not knowing about what I'm supposed to do all that much and so I just start following what she's told me. And so every 15 minutes I was, you know, rushing as quickly as I could to get the bathrooms done and then we'd sweep the floors, do all the things. And I began to notice that the other sackers, um, they, they didn't seem to be big fans of me. And I'm like, what in the world's going on? And finally, uh, one of the young men that I work with, he's like, what are you doing? Like, nobody keeps up with what she tells us to do. Like, you're supposed to kind of take it easy. And, you know, you don't actually have to clean the bathrooms. And I'm like, hey, man, I'm just trying to keep my job here. It's hard to get a job in still water and I'm hungry, right? So I need to, to earn some money. And I, I continued on just kind of doing what I did. And I, I realized over time, I wasn't very well liked among the sackers, I guess, because um, they didn't want to clean the bathrooms all that often. And if I did it, they realized they probably should too. Well, one day, uh, I was kind of in a, a little bit of a group of them there, and the, things were not good. They weren't happy with me. They were even kind of talking bad about me, making fun of me a little bit, and my manager walks up, and right there in front of all of the guys, she's like, hey, Jason, I just want you to know how thankful I am for you. Like, the bathrooms are clean, and the floors are swept. I'm really thankful for the job that you're doing here, and so me bragging to all my sack of friends, you know, my chest is puffed up, and I'm like, yes, like, this is what I, I wanted to hear. Now, I, I tell you that story for this reason. Um, you know, it really didn't matter what the other sackers thought of me if my boss was pleased, right? It didn't matter what their opinions were as long as the person in charge approved of me. And what I want you to know about you in this life 
is it doesn't matter what any person thinks about you, how well you perform at your job, or whether you failed or made a mistake or this or that. The God of the universe, whose opinion matters far more than any other opinion, he approves of you. He loves you. He chose you. He went to the cross to die, to purchase you with his own blood. Our worth is found in Jesus Christ and him alone. So the Apostle Paul points that out to the church there or to the leaders of the church there in Ephesus, reminds them of their worth. The second thing that he reminds them of is, uh, I describe this as the way of the church. And by the way, I meant um, the, the way that they live their lives together. Look what he says here in verse 18. You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I didn't shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and house to house. And then um, if you'll skip forward to verse 36 in chapter 20, uh, there's this description of Paul leaving. And when he had said these things, after he declares his final words to them, he knelt down and he prayed with them all. These men that he had loved, that he'd wept with, that he'd spent time with sharing the gospel with. There he's about to get on the boat. He's about to say his final farewell. They knelt down together. They prayed to God together. They wept together. The Apostle Paul, in his final address to the believers at, at Ephesus, he reminds them of the worth of the church, but he also reminds them of the way of the church, of the life that they had ultimately shared together. Um, they studied together. They had struggled together. The Apostle Paul was not the kind of leader that we might expect here in America. Um, kind of the pressure for us, the way that our culture would tell us that we should live, is you should never let anyone see you sweat, right? You should handle your business, take care of your stuff. You should have it all under control. The ducks are in a row. Your family's perfect. Your job's perfect. Your finances are perfect. That's how we are expected to live, right? Because we're kind of individualistic here. We pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. Um, and yet, that is not the biblical way of living at all. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul, who was a Hebrew of Hebrews and a Pharisee of Pharisees, one of the leading intellectuals of his day, he was an apostle who had seen Jesus, right? And yet, while he was with the believers at Ephesus, he was with them in all humility. It tells us that he was with them in tears, in the midst of trials. Do you know why you cry tears in the midst of trials? Because he was just like us. In the midst of trials, he was afraid. He was insecure. He was anxious about what was to come. He didn't know how he was going to make it through all of the things. So there with the believers in Ephesus, the apostle Paul had had cried with them. Now, there have been times of celebration, right? When people come to faith in Christ, there have been times of rejoicing. And there were times where the Apostle Paul, uh, in the midst of weakness, was praying with the believers there in Ephesus for strength to get through what was ultimately coming. There was a depth of relationship. There wasn't a man standing on a stage on a Sunday preaching a sermon and then never interacting with the body. Rather, the Apostle Paul was with them in, in public, but also it was with them in their homes. They shared meals together. They had shared life together. There was a depth of relationship present with Paul and the church at Ephesus that is rather uncommon in our culture. Now, this depth of fellowship, this biblical word for it, uh, Greek word for it is koinonia. And it basically gives us a picture of a deep, rich, abiding partnership together in the gospel. Uh, maybe against the grain of American culture, this is not, I'm going to make it on my own, kind of forge my own path, handle all my business without anyone else's help. Um, what we see in this fellowship, this biblical fellowship, is one of uh, rather intense dependence upon other believers, where we lock arm with other people to pursue Jesus Christ together, where we acknowledge that we, apart from Jesus Christ, we are sinful, that we are weak and helpless apart from Him. And yet, as a church of Jesus Christ, in Him, empowered by the Spirit, we lock arms together. We live our lives together, striving for the faith. And that's how the Apostle Paul lived among these people. That's how he spent life with the believers in Ephesus. He didn't pretend that he had it all together. 
The Apostle Paul would have had failures. He would have had disappointments, seasons of sorrow, of frustration. And he lived in the midst of the, the believers at Ephesus in this weakness. He describes his preaching elsewhere in the scriptures um, with fear and trembling. This note here that it says that he was testifying both in public and from house to house. Uh, there would have been times where it would have been hard for the Apostle Paul to proclaim in public uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, knowing what might come to him as a result. He felt the same things that you and I feel as we want to proclaim the gospel. And yet it was with the benefit and the help of these other believers that he was faithful while he was there. He gets to celebrate that he didn't shrink back from declaring everything that was profitable to them. And so he reminds them of the worth of the church and he reminds them of the way of the church. Something I, I want you to know, um, as believers in Jesus Christ, because we have our worth in him, because we are defined by the righteousness of Jesus Christ and not by our past and not by our mistakes and not by our failures, uh, but we are defined by the righteousness of Jesus, we are free to be honest with each other about our weaknesses and about our struggles. And our righteousness is in Him. And it's not our performance before other people. But instead, we can come and say, can I tell you where I'm struggling? And can I share with you my weakness? Would you pray for me in the midst of this? And I want to be a godly man. I want to be a godly woman, but here's where I'm struggling. So the Apostle Paul, he reminds them of the worth of the church. He reminds them of the way of life of the church. As a matter of fact, this way of life that we're talking about, living in this sort of fellowship, it wasn't unique to the church in Ephesus when the Apostle Paul was there. We actually see this in Acts chapter 2, when the church was just formed. The believers are brand new. You know what they automatically did at the leadership of the Spirit in their life? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, which is the word. And they devoted themselves to fellowship, to living their lives together. They would spend time, yes, listening to the apostles preach in Solomon's colonnade, but then they would meet house to house and they would, discuss, or they would discuss with one another what they were learning, how they were living. They were praying together, devoting themselves to the Lord together. And, and y'all, this wasn't just for the church in Acts. I believe this is for the church today that this is an essential ingredient in every one of our lives as well, that we walk in these deep, rich, abiding relationships with other believers, striving together for the faith of the gospel. But if you don't believe me, the Apostle Paul concludes here with a warning to, to men and women that he loved, that he spent life with. He concludes uh, what he's going to say to them uh, with a warning there in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. When I first started in ministry, I was going to be a veterinarian. That was going to be my path that I wanted to walk. I was in college at Oklahoma State, and I'd really been praying, okay, God, um, if you want me to go into ministry, please don't let me get into vet school because I don't want to go get in a bunch of debt and spend seven years and then, you know, wind up in ministry, not a veterinarian. So uh, about my junior year of college, God made it clear to me that he was uh, indeed calling me to ministry. And uh, God, in his goodness, he led me to a church in Van Buren, Arkansas. And so I I'd never even applied. I didn't know that they had a need. There was someone that talked to someone one, and I wound up there 22 years old, and I was a youth pastor in this church, and I could not wait to serve the Lord in this capacity. I mean, I was excited about serving the church and just offering myself, and y'all, I went after it. I worked 50 or 60 or 70 hours a week. I mean, I was uh, at, at campus clubs early in the morning. I was at different schools at lunch. I was at ball games in the evening, and basically, the more I would work, the more that my pastor would give me to do, and I worked, and I worked, and I worked, and I had a lot of joy in that. I was a single man. The problem with that is that I carried that same overwork, that same workaholism, I carried it into my adult life and into my marriage. In one of the most exhausting seasons of my ministry ever, I was running hard, doing great things for the Lord as far as I was concerned. And I was, I was getting, I was building things, I was doing things. In a moment where I wasn't careful, I was caught off guard. I had inappropriate conversation with a woman who wasn't my wife. I betrayed my wife. I did something I swore I would never do, and I never wanted to do. And I didn't intend on that. There were things in my life that I had put in place specifically to guard against that. 
Yet after it happened, I'm sitting there trying to reckon with the fact that my marriage might be over, that my ministry might be over, and I have no ability to put it back together again. I get to stand here today and I get to tell you that God has been good. God in His grace has restored my marriage. Uh, my wife was in the first service, but if she was here and she could stand on stage, which she would never do, but if she could stand up here and tell you, she would say she is thankful for the things that we've been through and specifically for what God has done in restoring our marriage. Our marriage is better than it's ever been. Now, she's not thankful for the sin. It was extraordinarily painful. Um, after I kind of came to my senses, um, after this happened, I went and I confessed to my wife. And I confessed to my pastor. And I called some of my friends and I confessed to them as well. And God has been so good to restore me, to restore my marriage, to allow me to serve here in ministry. But I tell you that story because I want you to know that for whatever reason, the Apostle Paul, in his farewell address to the believers at Ephesus that he loved so deeply, he took the time to warn them to be very careful, to pay very close attention to themselves and to the rest of the flock. And here is why. In verse 20, 29, he says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock that from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. Um, here's the problem, and here's why I got into trouble. It's because I didn't realize, I didn't realize that the enemy was out to get me. Now, I, I maybe knew that somewhere back in my mind, but I wasn't living as if that was true. I wasn't living carefully. I wasn't being very careful my, to, for myself. I was, I was maybe taking care of other people. I was concerned with ministering in the church and taking care of all the responsibilities I had, but I wasn't paying careful attention to myself. And it almost cost me my marriage. It almost cost me my ministry. And the thing that I would fear for the men and women in our church is that you think, no, 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 I'm pursuing Jesus. Life is great. Man, I, I'm reading my Bible every day. I go to church every Sunday, and you wouldn't realize just how vulnerable you are. You wouldn't realize that there's an enemy out there that seeks to steal and to kill and to destroy. What I want to encourage you with today is what the Apostle Paul encouraged the Ephesians with. Be very careful. Pay very careful attention to yourselves, but not just for you, but also to the rest of the flock. You know the, the problem with every single one of us? Listen, if we knew the enemy was coming, if it was like, you know, written down this day, this time, the enemy's going to come and he's going to tempt you, we would probably be fine. But the truth of it is, is we all live this life we, with, with some blind spots, some areas of our lives where we can't see ourselves very well. And we may think we have it together, right? We may think, no, 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 I'm doing great. Uh, but there are blind spots in every single one of our lives. Do you know how we make up for those? Do you know how we walk in victory over the enemy? We pay careful attention to ourselves, but also for the flock. That God has ordained that here in this body, that we don't just look out for ourselves, but we look out for one another. Can I just tell you that you desperately need men and women in your life who are willing to tell you the truth, who are willing to do what the Apostle Paul did here where he would admonish them, even with tears, and point them toward the truth and say, hey, I'm worried about what's happening in your life here. I see how things are going in your marriage. This doesn't seem healthy. I, I saw the way you talk to your kids or the pace that you're keeping and that people would love us enough to speak the truth to us. The truth of it is, is every single one of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, the enemy is out to steal and to kill and destroy. Now, what do we do about that? We're very careful for ourselves, but also for the flock. If you are not walking in biblical community, if you don't have that sort of biblical fellowship, men and women in your life who have locked arms with you and said, we are going to finish this race well together, I want you to know you're vulnerable. Isn't it interesting the language that the Apostle Paul used here? It's similar language that Jesus used. He talks about the enemy like a wolf and us like a sheep. Have y'all ever seen sheep? They're helpless. Man, when it comes down to sheep and wolf, the, the sheep never wins, right? They lose every single time. 
We need people in our lives who can care for us, and we need to hope in the fact that we have a good shepherd who is watching out for us. The, Paul is instructing the elders of the church of Ephesus to pay a careful attention to them as well, that they might watch out for the wolves who are ultimately coming in. We need the church, and we need one another in our lives. So, Here's what we do with this. The Apostle Paul, kind of three things that I'm summarizing that he talked about at the church at Ephesus. The worth of the church. The way in which they live their lives together. And then he gave them these, these two warnings. So how do we respond to this message of Christ as, as believers in him? How do we respond to this? Um, the first way is this. If you're here today and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, and maybe for the first time you've come to hear. Now you might have heard the words before, but you come to hear the gospel that Jesus Christ saw you just as you are and that he could not love you anymore. As a matter of fact, he went to the cross that you might enjoy fullness of life in him. So if you're here today and you, you don't know Jesus, you never trusted him as your savior, the, the first way you can respond is just by uh, responding to him in faith, crying out to Jesus to save you from your sins. The, the second way that you might respond is maybe you're here and you found your identity in something other than Christ. When I was young in ministry, my identity was in my work, is in being busy for the kingdom, and it got me in a lot of trouble. Maybe your identity is in your job, or in your family, or in the way that you look, or, or some, some other thing. Today, maybe you need to find your identity in Jesus Christ. Find your worth in Him, that you don't have to chase after the, the money, or the possessions, or the perfect life, or any other thing but you can simply be content in who you are in Christ Jesus. Maybe you need to find your worth in him today. The next way is maybe you're here today and you think about your life. Maybe you're here today and there are. Uh, you've had your own battles with sin. You find yourself falling down over and over and over and wondering why you can't seem to follow after Jesus with any level of consistency. I just want to remind you that Jesus never intended us for us to walk through this life alone. Maybe for you it's time to find a community of believers where you can come and just say, to, you know, confess your sins to them as James chapter 5 tells us. Confess your sins one to another and pray for each other that you may be healed. Maybe for you the healing and the victory that you're desiring in your walk with Jesus Christ um, is being hindered because you're not being willing to confess. You're not walking with a group of believers who are praying for you that you may be healed. So maybe today you need to find community. If, if you don't know how to get in a group here, uh, there's a welcome center on your way out. There are men and women that would love to visit with you and find a group. There are people that are needing community just like you are that would love for you to be in their group. The final piece here today is maybe there are sins that you just need to confess. Right here, right now, right where you are. It's time for the destruction to stop. It's time for the, the, the habits to go away. It's time for you to find renewal in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know uh, what God may be doing in you, but over these next few moments, we're going to offer you a time of response. And I want to invite you to respond in obedience to Jesus Christ. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the cross, for the blood that you shed. And Lord, we don't stand here defined by our past or our failures or any other thing. We are defined by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Lord, we are washed clean by your blood. And so we praise you for the cross. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, would you continue to lead us to that life that you purchased for us? Would you lead us into abundance and away from the empty things of this world? Father, would you just stir our hearts to respond in obedience to you over these next few minutes. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.